The thing about eating disorders is they numb every other impulse because they consume you and when you're just focused on kind of reducing your body and your habits and your lifestyle to numbers you can't think about anything else you certainly can't think of anything creative it was around 10 11 that i was like wow i i don't think i'm going to figure this whole womanhood adult thing out so i'm i'll just do this instead hi i'm Maya bialik and welcome to my breakdown this is the place where we break things down so you don't have to it's my and Bialik's breakdown. She's gonna break it down for you. Because you know she knows a thing or two. So now she's gonna break down. It's a breakdown. She's gonna break it down. My and Bialik's breakdown is supported by one. Hey everybody, repeat after me. I'm mad as hell and I'm not gonna take it anymore. What am I so mad about? I'll tell you what. Well, Jonathan and I just learned that banks are charging Americans $34 billion a year on overdraft payments. 34 billion. That's $160 for every adult American. We're being bilked by banks, people. Yes, they will lend you the money if you go over your balance, but then what happens? You're charged 30 to 35 dollars for that favor, even on the smallest overdrafts. And banks charge hefty fees unless you keep like a thousand dollars in your account. We've been bilked by banks. We've had fees that made no sense, that should not be there, that we did not deserve. Trouble reversing them. Trouble reversing them. We love what One is doing for their users. They're a much better option. They're going up against the big banks. One actually cares about their customers, and their service is so much better than traditional banks. You'll get $25 bonus when you use your One card. For full details, visit onefinance.com slash break. That's onefinance.com slash break. One believes in rewarding customers, not gouging them. Before we introduce our very special guest, who you may know from a little series of movies called Harry Potter. I don't know all the titles, but the series of movies called Harry Potter. Um, we are going to be welcoming Ivana Lynch. But first, I'd like to introduce my favorite retrieved soul, Jonathan Cohen. Oh, hello, Mime. That's a good intro. Also, there were some books I heard before the movies. Oh, there were Harry Potter books, but you will recognize her from um, from the film franchise. That's true. How are you doing? Pretty good. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. Ivana Lynch is an actress. She's a podcaster. She's also a vegan activist. Her professional career began at 14. She played the role of Luna Lovegood in the Harry Potter film series, and she did that from the time she was 14 to 19. Since then, she's continued to act on screen and stage. In 2018, she competed in and placed third in Dancing with the Stars, season 27, which is really cool. And in 2017, inspired by the dozens of letters and questions that she got from fans about her vegan lifestyle, she launched a really cool weekly vegan podcast, The Chick Peeps. Great name. Also, she co-founded, along with Daniela Monet, um, the vegan and cruelty-free makeup and beauty care box, Kinder Beauty Box, which I actually didn't know was hers. Like, I've gotten it before and didn't know. Um, she puts ethical brands in the spotlight. She wrote this really beautiful book called The Opposite of Butterfly Hunting, The Tragedy and Glory of Growing Up, a memoir. And she talks about her experience with anorexia, which began when she was very young, like before the time when we started seeing her on the big screen. Um, and, um, she's a very, very talented writer. It's very, um, it's a book that's gotten a, a lot of attention, not just for its content, but for the way that she writes, um, very, very honestly. And there's so much, um, that she's going to talk about with us today, um, that kind of makes the book even richer to, to consider and read. So, and also if you like shamans, wait till the end of the episode, we get there. We, we go, we go deep. We talk about moons shamans, ceremonies, maybe you know what plant medicine is. <laughs> Keep listening. Let's welcome Ivana Lynch. Break it down. Ivana, welcome. I've been to Ireland. Um, I've not been to Dublin, which is where most people go. Mm. I was at the ring, I was in the Ring of Killarney. I went to Cork, but they oh. say Cork. Mm -hmm. Yes, like uh, near Dingle, which is just yeah. fun to say. Um, it's beautiful, and I drove kind of that whole region of the country. It, it is stunning. I mean, it's a stunning, stunning country. Um, 
yeah, that was my experience with Ireland. I would like to go back and see mm. all the, the literary sites and, you know, all the, the Frank McCourt tour is what mm. I want, really. It's very beautiful. People are very friendly. There's no... Um, they don't really uh, understand boundaries as much over there. Everyone just, like my dad considers it very rude if you walk past a person on the street in London and they don't say, hello, you know, that's just their mentality. Um, but as a child teenager growing up there, you know, you don't you don't want to see scenery. That's not, that's not the exciting thing. <laughs> you don't even notice scenery and friendliness and all that. Um, but it's definitely that old cliche of having moved away. I appreciate it. Yeah. In a great tradition of Irish literature, um, you you have written a beautiful book, um, and not only is you know the information in it um, really it's touching, it's moving. Uh, a lot of people describe your book as gripping, mm-hmm. um, but your your use of language is is really um, what struck me and what Aww. struck what what strikes a lot of people. Um, is not only the content of your story, but the way that you've chosen to express it. Oh, thank you. I can't believe you read it. That's so kind. Oh, well, I I started it uh-huh. and then left it in my Jeopardy dressing room. So the oh, wow. truth is, <laughs> I know, the truth is I did not read all of it, but... Um, and right now it's in Ken Jennings' it's, hands. That's right. <laughs> but I did want to ask a, a little bit about sort of your experience um, as an artist in general, because... Many know you as an actress. Um, were you raised a generally artistically inclined child? Were you a writer in your youth? Were you more? Did you more gravitate towards performing arts? Tell us a little bit about your artistic childhood, as it were. Yeah. Um, so I grew up in a family of teachers. You know, house of books. Very, very. Uh, just bookish people really trusted books and that was a worthy thing to do with your time. Um, but I don't think it was, you know, the arts were, so they were valued and cultivated. That's all we did. Read stories, tell stories, um, a lot of play. Uh, my family was very crafty as well. Um, but it wasn't really uh, respected as a job or as a potential career path. Um, and as I say, they're, they're, they were, they're quite shy people. Quite my family are all introverts, um, so when I started to express my, an interest in acting, um, just because it looked so much fun, <laughs> um, they I, they I think they thought that was you know very much a fantasy. But I, I'm always really grateful for the fact that I was raised on stories and uh, words were valued so much, and the, the arts were valued. They just I suppose there was this sense of, you know, that's for people who are lucky and uh, they don't need to get a real job. And Mm. uh, there is also that old Irish mentality that your life should be about suffering. (laughs) You shouldn't get to enjoy your job. Like uh, there is there's sort of a uh, if you spend enough time there, you'll notice it. And I I believe it comes from the the, uh, strong religious influence about rules and that we're sinners and blah 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 um so I think when I started to yeah to really say I'd love to do acting or I'd love to be performing it was just like nobody gets it that good that sounds like too much fun that's what children do (laughs) um yeah it it took a well it took a role in Harry Potter to convince them that cool this can be a job (laughs) we showed them didn't we yeah yeah, yeah. um (laughs) just a small role in a major franchise just just that (laughs) um you have siblings I do. I have three siblings. And uh, what what's your birth order? Uh, uh, two older sisters and a younger brother. Wow. So you're you're the middle child, as it were. <laughs> yeah, middle child. But I think because I'm the youngest girl, I often it doesn't really. F- I think my older sister, she's the real middle child. Got you know? it. Yeah. And what did your parents teach? Um, my well, my dad is retired now, uh, but he taught. He was vice principal, and he taught history and Irish. Mm-hmm. And then my mom is still teaching. She teaches kids with uh, learning difficulties, like kids with um, like uh, autism or handicapped children, or or actually just children who have uh, just I don't know issues with being in the classroom and are too sensitive for that kind of environment. Mm. Also, lest people accuse us of. Ireland bashing, um, you know, that that notion of suffering, well, accuse me, they wouldn't accuse you because you're Irish, you can say whatever you want. <laughs> but the the notion that um, 
any culture, you know, but in particular, let's say, for example, Irish culture is associated with suffering. Um, absolutely. It's the it's the religious structure. It's the it's the political structure. It's the conflict, you know, from that region for centuries and centuries. Mm. Um, and also things like climate um, influence a culture. They influence the way we speak, the way we socialize, the way we spend our time. Um, and, you know, I, I, I wasn't kidding. You know, my, my parents were English teachers and um, you know, Irish poetry, Irish literature, that was, um, it, it was the height of artistic ecstasy was that, kind, I mean, on my father's gravestone is a James Joyce quote. They revere those writers so much like James Joyce that I'm so terrified to read Ulysses. Like, I, I, there's just <laughs> such a reverence around those works of literature. But I think it's also interesting as well, the, the, the amount of um, very well-known Irish writers who had to move away from Ireland, mm. who had to get away from that climate to actually you know, pursue their craft like James Joyce. And, and right. he, there was so so much sorrow in his work for what he left behind and his mm -hmm. father and his relationship with his father. But it was like, it, it was too close. It, being around that, he wouldn't have been able to pursue something so, um, I guess, far-fetched and abstract, his, which his art was. It's not unrelated to how I was sort of thinking about even the 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 subtitle i guess i don't know what that's if that's what it's called so your book is the opposite of butterfly hunting the tragedy and the glory of growing up a memoir um you know and even in that title you get um you know you get a little bit of a window into sort of the process that you not only that you went through but that you chose to um to pen you know you you chose to put it down this way uh, for a very specific reason one of the things that you do talk about um, with a tremendous amount of, you know, a lot of people don't like when I use this word, bravery. It's brave to share ways that you've struggled, especially when they're not pretty. Um, and, you know, you've chosen to share about a history of anorexia, which, you know, for you took you in and out of hospitals. You had a very, very significant um, clinical experience, you know, also with being sort of treated and examined and, you know, um, and you also have placed a large emphasis on kind of that examination of women in particular um, and our bodies and what we take in and what we restrict and what we hold and what we choose to keep from others. So what was your perception as, as a young person of sort of your place in society or in your body? When did you have that kind of awareness that that you think might have, you know, then led to this this eating disorder that you that you ended up developing? Oh, um. <sighs> Yeah, that's uh, it's hard to know where to start, and that that was the struggle with the book as well, because it's like you could go all the way back. My my therapist actually, um, my psychotherapist who was mentioned in, throughout the book, Natasha, she believes that eating disorders take root at least six years before they begin to sort of have visible symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, and I remember she said that to me after I'd finished the book, and it made me go back and think, you know. Yeah, just deeper things. Why do you latch onto food? You know, in the same way, why do some people latch onto alcohol to self soothe? Why do some people mm -hmm. latch onto other people? It's I don't know why, but for me, it became food. Um, and I, I guess it just I found some moments, and they are in the book of being a child and realizing, oh, I have to find something that gives me a reason to be here, that gives me a reason to take up space. I don't know, just uh, it's, uh, which I don't believe at all, you know, and that's the journey of the book. And that's been my journey to just be like, I can just exist. I can take up all the space and I don't have to have a reason. And um, we don't have to sort of commodify everything. I've had conversations with my dad since um, where he really believes shame is a good thing. He believes it stops people people from doing bad things. And uh, I, I see it as the opposite because I think I was completely ruled by shame. I think I was ashamed to be a body ashamed to be a person, ashamed of just, I really just thought the human body was disgusting and repulsive and, and that, uh, I should do everything to try and hide all those embarrassing things, which mm. included, you know, eating, <laughs> going to the toilet, uh, mm. uh, your flesh on your body. I really got this idea that, uh, in order to justify existing, I had to try and perfect it. Um, and of and course, how old were you when this sort of started? Um, around 10 or 11, that's when I started to kind of say, oh, wow, nobody's going to do this for me. I'm not going to, like, I would, you know, I, I admired women. I, I loved them, but I didn't see myself turning into one. I, I felt very awkward. I felt like this 
weird, strange, sort of extraneous person. <laughs> like, uh, what was I going to do, and what what, what that was going to make me special, or or make me? Uh, yeah, it was a really existential struggle. And I do, I I think most eating disorders and most mental health problems are come down to being existential. Um, it was just this sense of yeah, what can I do to deserve to sp- take up space? And I I didn't think I could, and uh, so this was something that. Uh, was very distracting it was like the the thing about eating disorders is they numb every other impulse because they consume you and when you're just focused on kind of reducing your body and your habits and your lifestyle to numbers you can't think about anything else you certainly can't think of anything creative um so yeah yeah it was it was around 10 11 that I was like wow I I don't think I'm going to figure this whole womanhood adult thing out so I'm I'll just do this instead The Alex Breakdown is supported by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Life can be very overwhelming. Many people are burned out and they don't even know it. Symptoms, lack of motivation, feeling helpless, feeling trapped, detachment, fatigue. I mean, this happened to me and I didn't know what was going on. My energy level totally dropped. My motivation to do uh, things that I really normally enjoyed, I just sort of lost my zest for doing them (laughs) and I just like couldn't get enough sleep and really what was going on was I was totally burnt out I had too much on my plate and I was just struggling in a way that I didn't realize I have found therapy to be the the one constant in my life that is there to help me process gain a new perspective get things off my chest and start making changes so what is better help well it's customized online therapy with video phone and even live chat sessions with your therapist you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to and it's more affordable than in-person therapy you can be matched with someone in under 48 hours our listeners get 10 percent off their first month at betterhelp.com break that's better h-e-l-p.com slash break my mb alex breakdown is supported by Ritual. Does your probiotic contain clinically studied strains? Meet one that does. Ritual Symbiotic Plus contains two of the world's most studied strains with over 350 publications of human clinical trials. We love starting our day with Ritual because then we don't worry the rest of the day what's happening with our food. I mean, obviously you still want to worry and think about what you eat, but knowing that you're starting off the day with prebiotics, probiotics, and a postbiotic is what Symbiotic Plus gives you the confidence to be able to do. What makes these components so clearly ritual? They're science-backed, they're research-stacked, especially when stacked up against the leading direct-to-consumer and top-selling probiotics on the market. Symbiotic Plus and Ritual are here to celebrate, not hide your insides. There's no more shame in your gut game. That's why Ritual is offering our listeners 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash breakdown to start Ritual or add Symbiotic Plus to your subscription today. And sort of part of the the complexity, especially with with anorexia, anorexia nervosa, um, for for a lot of people, the the perfection, you know, is seen as kind of not changing, right? Mm-hmm. And keeping the body a very specific way that you know is obviously subjective, but for the mm. person experiencing it, there's a specific, you know, for some people it is a number, um, for some people it's a certain size, you know, of of clothing. Um, but what I think is really um, really poignant about the way you choose to speak about it is um, for you, it's also associated with leaving childhood and entering adulthood, which obviously we have a, a physical representation of that. You know, we we go through puberty, you know, boys and girls, right? We go through puberty. Um, but there's something about, you know, this kind of transition that you're talking about that goes beyond I want to be skinny, right? Or what a lot of people think of when they think of anorexia, right? Mm -hmm, Like, mm -hmm. I want to look good in this dress. Like for you, like you said, this was more of an existential thing. Can you speak a little bit about, did you have an an emotional kind of attachment, meaning to, did you have an emotional attachment to not wanting to get older? And like, were there things that were so comfortable in childhood, separate from your body image and your weight that you wanted to try and preserve? Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted, I kind of wanted to be invisible. I wanted just to be left alone and to be innocent. And everything I saw about womanhood and growing up was about uh, being seen, taking up space, making mistakes, uh, being criticized by people, I suppose. Um, I just didn't want to be in the way at all. I think I was just a very sensitive child and any, any criticism or any 
the time being seen, it was just like too much. And that's the thing with, with puberty and with growing up. It's like your life becomes less tidy. You're not this innocent, sweet little girl. And, and, uh, I was really terrified of leaving of leaving that innocence and having to take responsibility and and be seen. It just sounded like a horror story to me and it was just like I never asked for this. So so I'll just stay this way and, and that was the the hard thing about, you know, seeing it as a problem, seeing it as mm. seeking treatment because I I really just felt like I'm handling this fine. Everyone just right. leave me alone. I I don't feel this pain and this fear that I was feeling before I found this thing that sort of numbed me um so yeah it was absolutely it was all to do with not yeah not wanting to take up just face um space in every sense of the word you know like mm -hmm. literal but but also emotionally like I just wanted to be invisible to kind of fade away and, and not have to deal with the world yeah. Were there things in particular um, that I don't want to say scared you because I don't want to put fear on it if it wasn't fear based specifically. But, um, you know, for some people, they have, you know, they, they feel trepidatious about, for example, having to eventually get a job or having to be in a relationship or needing to leave home. Like, was there something in particular that you kind of focused on or was it just kind of like everything in general? Mm. I think um I think there's a few things my my mother's love like my mother was just the absolute center of my world and in a way still is you know that's a scary thought that one day that won't be there because it just feels so certain and I I think I start to realize oh there's never going to be anybody who will love me as much as this uh, and that's then that's really scary that, that if that's if that's the thing that keeps you rooted um so there was that and then I also I suppose I started to um I started to just f see to, to, uh, to have these dreams and they were big dreams you know about acting and other which it's such a like um it feels like such a contrast to Oh, to choose a profession that is literally all about rejection and criticism. Exactly, exactly. But I think other people might say, well, why would you do that? You know, you could have done anything. You could have spared yourself all that pain. But um, so I, I think I started to just feel so not good enough for these big dreams I had. Um, and just this fear that, like, I'm going to go out there and, and try all this and it, nothing I ever do will, will be enough. And that's still sort of a wound point mm -hmm. for me that's something I have to watch where if I go for an audition and I don't get it sometimes it can feel like the world is ending and it's that whole oh no you've proven it true again you've proven that that thought that story mm -hmm. true that you're still not good enough for this so um yeah yeah that that was that was one of the big fears of growing up of and 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 I think finding something to distract me all from all that was a relief because uh it was just like well I, I won't fail at this thing it might you know, sort of undo me. It might destroy me, but I won't fail at it. And I think it's also important to point out, you said, you know, you kind of said it in passing. You said I was a very sensitive child and I'm not, I'm not going to get up into your siblings business, but I will say that you can have 10 sisters in one family and every, each of them will have a different experience. Meaning, you know, a lot of people would say like, well, what was going on in her house? But it's not that simple. Meaning some of us come out I'm one of them. Some of us come out of the womb with a very special sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth sense to perceive things that sometimes aren't there or to perceive things that other people don't perceive. There's all this variability, you know? I was a child who I've talked about here at 10. That was like the first birthday I started crying on. I cry every birthday and it was just mortality. It was yeah. just like, why is no one understanding that this is not a happy day, you know? Yeah. Um, but you could take, you know, um, your sisters may not have had those feelings or your brother, you know, it's a, it's completely about your individual chemistry, your genetics and the way you interact in the time you were born into your family. It's so variable. So I just wanted to say that also. That's so true. And and that's something I always wanted to stress in the book, because a lot of the time with previous um, memoirs or stories I've read of people with eating disorders, they kind of 
pin it all on a triggering event, a big traumatizing event. And I always felt like such a fraud because I was like, I don't have one of those. I had a great childhood. I was so loved. I was given everything I really needed. Um, and yet I still did not want to be alive, <laughs> you know, and it, it, a, a big part of recovery was just accepting that and just accepting, uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I feel too much, you know, and I feel, I feel a lot. I and feel a lot, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There, there, I found places for all those feelings now, I find outlets, healthier outlets. But yeah, I think you have to just, uh, that's a very important point that you make. And, um, you know, there's things you, like, our brains are, us, we're fascinating. We're always going to be learning about ourselves and what, what it is. Like, um, there's a podcaster I listen to, I love him, he's brilliant. And by the way, as I'm talking to you, my accent is going less Irish. So if you want someone with a genuine Irish accent, listen to um, Blind Boy podcast. It is brilliant. Mm. He's very, he's very just funny and smart. And but anyway, last um, last week on the podcast, he had just discovered he's uh, he's um, on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, he literally just found out he's neurodivergent and mm -hmm. did a whole podcast about that. And he was making sense of all these things in his childhood. So. And, you know, he's gone through his life not knowing this about himself, not knowing why he would cry so much when little things happen that other people weren't affected by. So, uh, yeah, it's a process. I don't think there's any point in judging ourselves for how we feel. We just have to accept them and, and honor them, I think, and then find ways to make ourselves feel okay. <laughs> Your disease was very active in actually right around the time that you auditioned for Harry Potter. Is that right? Um, not entirely. So, okay. um, yeah, it sort of started around the age of 10, 11. Uh, and then it was uh, 11, 12. Those two years was when I was, as in physically visible. Right, um, right. Physically, medically serious. And that's when I was in and out of hospitals and everything. Got it. But it's always a point I want, I always try to make because this story has been, and that's honestly why I wrote the book, because it's been sensationalized so many times ever since I started speaking about it. There was this impression that I went straight from, you know, the the medical from rehab right. to the Harry Potter sets and you, your dreams can just happen just like that. And I right. always, it's so important to show people that um, there were like two years between finishing the treatment center and, and being physically recovered. But, you know, and, and between that and getting the part in Harry Potter, because uh, and they were crucial. Those I don't think I could I, I don't think I would have been well enough. I don't think I could have focused on the job if I hadn't committed to it. But I just really I don't like the implication that you can kind of incentivize recovery and you can say, no, absolutely. You know, oh, here's your little dream. Come and get it. And then you'll you know, you'll feel better. So, um, well, that's yeah, that's sort of a something I get very, very um, nervous about when I hear people say, you know, like here was the quick and easy solution or like mm -hmm. I got into therapy and then everything was amazing or mm. I found the perfect guy and then no, nothing bothered me ever again or, you know, even with recovery, you know, I worked the steps and now mm. I'm fine. It's a it's a constantly evolving process. But I'm also thinking of how how young you still were um, with, you know, kind of already so much recovery with you. What was your kind? Is that a cat? Yes. Did you give, it a, you gave it a lion cut? <laughs> I love oh, hold that. On. Is that a I, we oh, need to, we're going in a... Everything needs to this stop. This is Puff, and she has her summer haircut. And Yeah, that is her summer haircut. Yeah. I want to touch that cat. <laughs> she does what? feel like velvet. She's Wait, yeah. can I see the tail? I'm sorry. Yes, this yes, just of became course. very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Is that a Persian? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She So she's yeah. normally like three yes, times I can this imagine. size, so <laughs> fluffy. But it's just gotten so hot in London here the last few weeks, so we have to do it. Yeah. I mean, sorry, that's, that's a showstopper cat right there <laughs> with that haircut. My MB Alex Breakdown is supported by Rothy's. We all know that it can feel really good when someone compliments you on what you're wearing. Have you ever seen someone wearing a colorful pair of flats and thought, dang, those are cute? They might have been Rothy's. I find people all the time wearing Rothy's, and I say, I know those are Rothy's. They're so cute. And they say, yes, they are. Rothy's are the perfect shoes for commuting, for traveling, and you will get a lot of notice. They have tons of iconic head-turning designs in bright but sophisticated colors, and they work great with every outfit. You can wear them with yoga pants. You can dress them up for a night out. They're very comfortable. It really is. It's like a slipper. I've worn the flats. I've worn the loafers. I happen to love the booties. Those are still really one of my favorites. But yes, the black point toe flat 
it's a classic. Your new favorites are waiting. Discover the versatile styles you can wear absolutely anywhere. Get 20% off your first purchase at rothys.com slash breakdown. That's R-O-T-H-Y-S dot com slash breakdown for $20 off your first order. My MBLX Breakdown is supported by Nutrafol. Jonathan, this is something I talk about a lot. 30 million women are impacted by weakened or thinning hair. I'm one of them, and if you're one of them, you're not alone. There is a solution you can trust to deliver results. Thousands of women have taken back control of their hair with Nutrafol. Many say the supplement doesn't only transform their hair, it transforms their confidence and restores it. Nutrafol has two targeted formulas for women that are clinically shown to improve hair growth and thickness with less shedding through all stages of life. It takes time. You'll begin to experience thicker, stronger, faster growing hair in three to six months. And in a clinical study, after six months, 86% of the women reported improved hair growth. You can grow thicker, healthier hair and support our show by going to Nutrafol.com. Enter the promo code BREAK. Save $15 off your first month's subscription. This is their best offer anywhere. It's available to U.S. customers for a limited time and you get free shipping on every order. $15 off. Go to Nutrafol.com, spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L.com, promo code BREAK. So I was saying, you, you already had kind of so much recovery when you then embarked on this very public, you know, and incredible kind of, you know, media journey. What was your regimen for wellness at that time? Ooh. Like, <laughs> were you in therapy? You know, did you like, you know, you you obviously were at a, a healthy weight. Um, you know, how did you kind of maintain that, especially with all the stress and just excitement, you know, going on? Because those are times when a lot of our eating disorders will They'll come back when things are really good. They'll come back when things are not so good. You know, it's a constant struggle. No, and I think you're right to make the point that, uh, like, I, I was physically recovered, but, and it's only something I've realized in recent years. Oh, I did still, I still had an eating disorder. Because if you don't, if you don't subscribe to that thought, then you're saying, oh, eating disorders are only valid or they're only treatable when we physically can see them. And, and by then, you know, that person has been suffering for a long time. So no, it's true to say I was definitely still dealing with it. And, and it, it's, I mean, it, it really, it's a big identity struggle in the, in the aftermath of recovery, because you've spent so long identifying yourself as a certain size or as a certain lifestyle. And then suddenly you're just a quote unquote, normal person. Um, so I was dealing with that, but, and I know a lot of people have said to me like, well, didn't it, you know, being thrust in front of a camera, didn't that sort of trigger this whole self-criticism? But I actually feel like, um, I, I'd done so much work and I'd like, I was my biggest bully. Like it didn't matter what anyone said online. And and luckily the online world wasn't as active back then, but there were forums and things. And and no one anything said was as bad. So uh, th- th- I could never be as her as as what that my eating disorder really had done to me. So in a way I was sort of primed <laughs> for this industry. <laughs> I would mm. I I was prepared. Um uh, but in terms of wellness, yes, I, I had a therapist, uh, um, this therapist, and she's in the book, uh, Natasha, she's a very alternative person. Um, she's a, 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 a existential psychologist. And she, um, but she's now gone in a very alternative direction with she's doing all these plant medicine, all these, uh, well, retreats doing plant medicine you're in a safe so, place yeah she, your <laughs> okay okay i figured i've listened to your podcast um <laughs> but uh yeah she doesn't even believe in talking therapy anymore it's it's really mm. interesting she's somebody who'd be interesting to talk to jonathan would love non-talking <laughs> therapy <laughs> he can check it off his box without having to talk yeah well I think this is just an interesting segue to go down because Mime and I were having this conversation yesterday I believe in talk therapy and also I believe that you can intellectualize yourself so far down a path that your body is not with you. Ah, yes. There's a lack of embodiment to whatever the intellect has justified or understood about whatever situation they have. The experience of the body is that it's terrified, it's in whatever issue it has, Mm -hmm. and it hasn't metabolized it. And so it has a a programming, a a way of operating, a frequency. And then the mind is over here being like, but I know what the issue is and I've understood this and they've intellectualized it. And those two things, if those two things don't merge together and, and, and move forward together, then you're still going to bump up against like your, your body is going to have that reaction. It would make sense to me that someone 
who had done a lot of talk therapy or and brought patients and clients through talk therapy may be like, well, what if I start working from the body to the mind and to the emotions that way? Mm. I think her experience, not to speak for her, but from what I've heard, is that she said you, you get there so much quicker. Like people can spend years talking and, and you can convince yourselves of these stories, you know, and then um, – you go do ayahuasca and you have a crazy experience where you, I don't know. Understand the universe in a way you never thought you could. You understand the universe exactly, yeah. And 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 then, or, or you find out something very traumatic from your past that you didn't realize was actually so upsetting. And then you confront it and you work through it. And she, her philosophy is like, why would you spend decades talking about it when you could just go right in there? But uh, I, I'm speaking as somebody who has actually not done these plant medicines. Um, I actually still really like talking therapy. I like words. <laughs> so, um, yeah. But anyway, back then, to answer your question, I was just, I was seeing her. I was talking to her um, every week, really just working through things. And uh, I think it's really important that people, with, with things like this, and when you put it in a book, people want to hear the beginning, middle, end. And that's the hard thing with these books. And that's what's hard to write the memoirs. Like it doesn't have an end yet. The end is the rest of my life, really. Um, uh, but people want to say, you recovered and that's it. And now you're thriving and you are you have had this meteoric rise and success. And that's great. And and I guess I, I really found that uh, I had this great big thing happen after Harry Potter and acting and all that, but still was dealing with my problems. So um uh yeah i think it's so important that people know you don't just get the therapy in the emergency situation that's just putting out the fires that's just mm -hmm. the band-aid and then you take it off and that there's you have to go deep to the wounding yeah so what ages was your harry potter stretch uh 14 till 19. wow those are the same years i was on television when i was that age oh Really? Television's different. Yes, telev I was on a show from 14 to 19. Yeah. I started being on television two years before you were born. You know, like it was a long time ago. There was no internet. We didn't have home computers. Like there were no phones. So, you know, I looked like a 14-year-old when I started. I mean, I, I looked, I mean, people are like, oh, you look so young. No, just there was a variety <sighs> of what girls were allowed to look like and you didn't have to have hair extensions and, you know, <laughs> nails and a ton of makeup. Like, I barely wore makeup, you know, on TV that whole first year. Do you feel like you missed out by being, you know, already in a working professional environment? I mean, I, I know I did, you know. I, I had access to a world of adults that mm. other 14-year-olds and 15-year-olds did not. So I gained a tremendous amount of knowledge about um, the business world and how to please people and what happens when you state your needs and other people don't like them. And I learned a lot about people wanting to take advantage of you for their own, you know, financial gain. Like I learned all sorts of things. I also learned a tremendous amount about interpersonal relations, about, um, you know, p performance as a bridge to understanding humans. I was a very observant actor. So, um, you know, I, I learned a lot about I don't want to say the craft, but more about production and how things, you know, come together. But yeah, I missed out on a tremendous amount of normalcy. Um, you know, I, I wasn't an anonymous person, you know, which is a gift that um, most 14 year olds, you know, let's say have. And it's very hard to talk about. And I'm sure, well, I think you've I think you've done it with a lot more elegance than I would have known how Ooh, to. Debatable. Nobody wants to, well, but nobody wants to hear like, my life was so hard, you know, but the <laughs> fact is like, there's a lot in my experience before I even got to television, as you've spoken about in your life, mm -hmm. that no one knows about. Well, we talk about it on the podcast, but there was a whole life to me. And people are like, oh, when you got on television, is that when you like really started having your problems? Like, <laughs> no, I had problems from like the generations of people in my family have had problems. Like, exactly. I was like, I didn't all that. have like, yeah, it wasn't the industry that did that to me. But, um, you know, when people remark like, oh, you hold yourself so well, you're so articulate. You're so, it's like, yeah, I've been in meetings since I'm 13 years old. Yeah. Were, were you able to have a little bit of a 
normal life, obviously you were extremely recognizable, but like, because you weren't working necessarily those nine months, like a television show in between movies as a child, were you able to sort of fall back into somewhat of a normal routine? Definitely. Yeah. I went back to my on cool part of the classroom. <laughs> I just read books in the corner. Um, yeah, no, definitely. And I think back then it actually was a more innocent time, even though it was not that long ago. Uh, you know, no social media. We weren't really we knew obviously that harry potter was this huge global phenomenon because the movies would come out every summer and we'd see ourselves on buses and we'd go to the premiere and that's where we meet people but the rest of the time it wasn't like every day you're engaging with followers or people telling you right. just weird things about yourself so um and, and i think they deliberately protected us from that the producers kept it like even after everyone turned 16 and didn't legally have to be tutored um they, they made space for schooling and, and just, they kept these like the hours for working, you know, child actors, mostly as far as I know. Um, so yeah, it, it was okay. you know, like, it, as I say, it was a more innocent time. And I think yeah. sometimes I, I look at the young actors today who get these big shows and I'm like, damn, they're so savvy. They're so like, they have, they're so autonomous and they're already using the word career and a, they have a website <laughs> and business cards. And I sort of envy that, but they, they, they miss their innocence, you know? Well, and I think especially for women that's highlighted, you know, when a lot of the pressures of our culture, you know, Western culture in predict in particular, um, there's, there's a lot of, you know, manipulation. I don't mean that necessarily in a derogatory way, but there's a lot of manipulation of females, meaning there's, you know, sh and I know men also wear shapewear. Men also dye their hair. But historically speaking, in our culture, it's a lot of like women doing this and women doing that and change your hair, change your lashes, change your brows. Ch you know, like it's a lot of emphasis on the things that, you know, when I see 14 year olds now, they look like they look like I did when I was 18, you know, or and even then I was, you know, not ready to really own my my body, my presence, I wear extensions like you could barely get me to like not wear a baseball hat, you know, for most of my teen years. I, I want to ask you two things that are not related. So <laughs> I'll ask the first one and then please know that it's not related to the second thing. Yeah. You did date um, a fellow actor, correct? Yes, I did. Yeah. And what was what was that like also? Because I just know from the years that, I, you know, the, the years of 14 to 19 are those years where you're typically experiencing, you know, either like romance or crushes. And to do that when also you have a different identity is just it's very, very strange. But I'm, I'm just wondering kind of if you have any, you know, thoughts, especially as you're like transitioning to being a woman, you know, which was this thing that you had obviously been thinking about since you were so young. Was having a relationship like that, was it helpful for, you know, your, kind of your growth? Like, what, what was that like, especially as a public person? Um, so I didn't, I didn't have, I wasn't dating the, the, this actor who is mm -hmm. now a friend. Um, mm -hmm. I wasn't dating him back when I was 14. We started dating maybe when I was 20, 21. Okay, got it. So it was yeah. after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think because we worked on the same films, yeah. people just immediately, but I actually didn't meet him all of that time. Um but, uh, I mean, dating an actor is one thing because it's <laughs> like, oh, I don't know, you're, you're, they're constantly kind of in competition a little bit and trying to outdo each other. Even if you're not up for the same roles, it's it's hard. Um, but there is an understanding. Yeah, I think my relationships definitely, you know, back then they, they gave me confidence. But I think, like, I was still struggling for all of my teen years, struggling with my body image. And it. I, I don't believe that, you know, that kind of old saying that very much has been uh, uh, torn apart and rightfully so by our generation of saying oh you you can't be loved until you love yourself uh, but I think you you kind of you can be loved to the level that you let it in and I didn't love my body didn't like it at all so it was very hard to kind of respect people who respect guys I was dating who were trying to love me in that way um, but but at the same time you know they did it did give me confidence you know, dating people who were nice and who tried to compliment me. Um, it, it made me feel like, Oh, maybe, I, maybe there's a different perspective. Maybe I, maybe all these dark mean thoughts are not the true ones. And maybe the, the other nice perspective can also be true. Mm. Um, but I do also feel like, you, you know, wherever you're at in your life, you, you, the person you're dating is a reflection of you. And the more you work on yourself, the more you are um, 
just evolving and, and becoming kinder to yourself, becoming the kind of person you really respect, uh, the more you'll see that in your partner too. So, um, yeah, in, in my, uh, you know, early teen years, my early relationships, there was definitely more of a darkness to them because mm -hmm. we were usually people who, yeah, didn't, didn't feel comfortable with ourselves. And No, that's very helpful. Um, there's a quote that, you know, is... I'd say one of the quotes most associated, um, at least, you know, sort of in some of the research that I did with you, this notion of being kind of addicted to people who make you feel bad. Um, and this is separate from a dating conversation. That's why I felt awkward that these two questions came up next to each other, because um, this can be true and it can have nothing to do with dating or, or partnership. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of what what phase of your life and kind of what that looked like having that realization and I guess what you did with that information? Uh, yes, uh, I think, um, again, it's about your inner voice. When your inner voice is very negative, you'll resonate with people who, uh, who mirror that negativity because you you kind of feel like anything else, any nice things is just BS. You think that person's lying, obviously. I want to, the, the, the true thing is the mean thing. Um, so I think it was probably, um, it was actually probably, so I spent like five years in LA, in Hollywood, uh, really going for it as an actor, really going for everything I could, trying to get everything. And um, having this sense of what's wrong with me? Why am I not getting these? So, and so anytime somebody would tell me something that was wrong with me, I'd be attracted to them because I'd be like, oh, you have the answers, you'll help me. And the thing about, you know, there are a lot of manipulative characters I, in my experience, a lot of manipulative men who will sort of, uh, or, or, there's studies into it as well, like narcissists, maybe not just men, mm -hmm. just narcissistic people where they'll, um, you know, f sort of feed you love. They'll get you kind of hooked on them. And then uh, when you're hooked, then they will just sort of turn and mm. uh, just, just, um yeah, fill your mind with all the, all the dark thoughts. But because you think, oh, they love you, they love me, that, so they're mm. saying this out of love and they're doing is to try and improve me. And things like, you know, pursuing dreams, it's a, it's a difficult, it's like nuanced, isn't it? It's like you'll, you want to do everything for your dreams, but you also don't want to self-destruct. Uh, so uh, that balance was hard for me. And I think I definitely fell into that trap in L.A. of... Uh, people pleasing you know not going into the room as an artist saying I have a voice I have an opinion and they're valid and interesting I went in there going I want you to like me what can I do let me contort myself and turn myself inside and I think LA like it's a place I obviously I've seen the great side of it. I met many I kind of found myself there met many amazing creative people but I also found the side it's a of, meat grinder for your soul yeah. And like, there's so many people willing to offer you opinions on what's wrong with you and, and to charge you for it. Um, and I, as I say, like that to me was an addiction. It was like, uh, th these people will give me the answers and then I'll be fixed and then I'll be worthy. And you'll never get to the end of that. What were the things that you were told were wrong with you? You could be as specific or general as you'd like. Oh, my voice is a big one. Um, just always being told that I sound too apologetic or too like a little girl or just too high. So I, I spent, and the thing is, I kind of can see that. I can still see that. Like, oh, maybe if I had a stronger, more commanding voice, maybe I would. There is that voice that goes, would I be more successful? Would people believe me more as an adult? <laughs> um, but I spent thousands of pounds trying to work on my voice and speak in the slow register. And really? Yeah, yeah. So that just... you could sound like me. <laughs> yeah, something like it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to the untrained listener, is that like going into voice sessions and like learning how to drop the register? Like what does that yes, entail? Yes, and learning. Um, uh, and by the way, I actually really liked my voice teacher. That was a tricky thing. Like this was a kind person who thought she, I think she thought she was doing good. And I, I it was helpful to like hear myself in different, but it, the fact of the matter was just like, oh, I just, it's going to take so much work and it would be an obsession to try and change it. And did I need to? Since Jonathan has never been to a voice teacher, yeah, it's basically, I mean, it's a psychology of where you place your voice. Yes. Um, and I had vocal cord surgery. And so I had to obviously go to a, you know, a, speech pathologist, neuro, blah, blah, blah. But they talk a lot about, yeah. you know, 
the volume you use, the way that you use it, where you place it, where your tongue is, where your breath is, it's a huge psychological process of even doing that kind of work on your voice. And uh, my voice teacher would get me to record myself at different times of the day and center. Yep. Like in the morning, it would be much like lower and more relaxed. And I started doing this thing, like recording myself in the morning, recording myself later and trying to, m trying to mm -hmm. get back to what that was. And also like, humming i would just everywhere i'd go i'd be humming you yep. hum and then you go into conversation because then your voice yes, is in a lower register yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. so so before meetings with people i would just be in my car mm, hello you know trying to get into that register yeah okay so your voice what else the thing was i kind of did a lot of things without being told. So I did fix my teeth. Uh, <laughs> like I, You I, have lovely teeth. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I don't know. I quit sugar and things like that. I would, mm. uh, being in Hollywood, seeing, you know, I remember one a friend just being appalled that I didn't have a manicure. And I was like, what? Sorry, do you get them every two weeks here? <laughs> and just like, so... No, I didn't have people telling me. I didn't have that kind of right. douchebag manager. Oh, no, I've got a wonderful <laughs> team who are very protective of me. But um, I think being in a place where it's possible to change literally everything about yes. yourself and it's sort of encouraged as like, how much do you want your dream? Uh, right. Yeah, I, I was like, cool, whatever I, anyone's doing, I'll do it. <laughs> well, and for so many people that can lead specifically to body stuff, especially for women, um, just in terms of kind of like the workout regimen that we're in, encouraged to do and plastic surgery, which is, it's ubiquitous. I think all of that was really helpful being around that environment where that was like self-improvement was aggressively encouraged and pursued. I think it it reached, got me to a breaking point of being like, no, screw this. I, I, I kind of like my weird high voice. I'm comfortable <laughs> with it, you know, I'm fine. I'm like, and, and another big thing was I was always told like, oh, you, you're you going to have to, you know, trash the Harry Potter image and, or, ju or just like get away from it and you're going to have to reinvent yourself. And again, it was like, I really like Harry Potter. I really like Thin Love Good. <laughs> I was just like, I like having blonde hair. All these things that was just like, let's change everything. That's often suggested that you do do a racy photo shoot is usually something that you're advised to do. Not you, but that... Um, to, I do them all the time. <laughs> to break away from that image. And also, with the way our culture has shifted, there's so much now kind of like middle ground of racy. Meaning it used to be like, oh, she went and posed nude for Playboy. Or, oh, she posed topless. Whereas now there's like a million magazines and websites that are not nude or topless, mm. but where you can express an image of yourself that is you know, really culturally condoned, you know, for women to to do the lingerie and to do, you know, kind of all that stuff. So there's so much room for that, meaning there's been so much room made for that, that I think that is something that a lot of women, you know, feel drawn to. Yeah, Not definitely. that there's anything wrong with it. No, no, exactly. If you want to express <laughs> yourself that way, but... Uh, yeah, no, no, not everyone does. And, um, but it's, I think it's a tricky thing as an actor, because sometimes there is this idea that like, you kind of have to be a blank slate on ta and take on any character and be a, jump into anyone. That's great if you want to do that. But yeah, I think I got to a point where I was like, oh, I don't want to play characters I don't really like, or who, f who just don't, don't feel like somebody I'd like to hang out with. Um, so I kind of stopped doing all those things where it felt like, Every time you play a new character, you got to just, yeah, wipe yourself cl as a clean slate. And I, but, you know, I've been really inspired by a, a lot of actors just, uh, well, I, I like the way casting is going, that there's more diverse casting. And they cast people with tattoos and interesting mm -hmm. looks and people who haven't just always tried to um, g keep themselves like empty looking, you know? Um, we did want to ask a little bit um, about your more holistic side um, and, you know, kind of not sure what you like to share. What are the things that you do um, sort of to maintain, you know, either your your mental wellness or your general happiness or satisfaction in life? Um, what are the things that you do? Like some people meditate, some people like therapy, uh, some people like crystals, uh, some people like astrology, um, I'm I'm out of things. Some people go to witch doctors like I do. Yeah, there's those are all good things. Um <laughs> my thing uh now is uh, circus. I'm really passionate about like aerial hoop hmm. silks that kind of thing and it's been the thing that I've found that 
actually works and sticks it makes me really happy and I saying this I do recognize it's kind of a dependence you know because my therapist is always like yeah but what happens but when you take that away and you just sit there with your you know your unvarnished self <laughs> um she she's always pushing me to go there so I, I know it's a it's a yeah it's it's another thing but I that is my personality where uh I always want to be doing something. But for me, circus is a way to sort of channel that energy because it is, you have to be strong. Uh, you have to be very passionate. Uh, you have to be a little bit crazy because like, uh, let's say crazy. No, I don't mean crazy, but like, it really hurts. You're always getting bruised and doing things and, and, and it, you're doing kind of scary things. But uh, there's something so rewarding and so invigorating about pushing through the fear and pushing through the pain and seeing your body evolve and be able to do cool things. So yeah, I do that almost every day and wow. to the point where I'm, I'm at a point of just being like, oh, I think I like this more than anything I do in my life. And can <laughs> I, at the ripe old age of 30, turn it into a career? Let's see. <laughs> Obviously, you, you wrote this book. Are there other books in you? Are you, you know, is this sort of a path that you're interested in? Let's say more than acting or in addition? Yeah, I think more than acting. Yeah, I, I, I love, well, I love books. I, I read way more books than I watch movies. And that to me was, when I realized that, I was like, oh, that's a big clue <laughs> that I should be pursuing this. If I think you kind of tend to pursue the thing that you love and meant to be doing the most um so yeah but I'll never write non-fiction again it was <laughs> it was grueling <laughs> you know it was like for me and my family and all the people around me and also every time people ask me what's your book about it's like I have to revisit all these old traumas <laughs> and I'm like I'm so far past these I don't want to talk about it anymore um so yeah fiction next that is my plan we can't let you go without asking about your shaman teacher oh my shaman teacher Yes, she, her name is Catherine. Um, that was probably an intuitive thing as well, where I just was having a bit of a, it was like, I don't know, you mentioned astrology. Are you into astrology? Yeah, well, we're both kind of into all the things and we've both kind of like done, tried all the things. Yeah. So yeah, we're very curious. We also read a quote in our research that said that you uh, have a practice of astrology and that, you know. That the moon is special to you. Aligning oh. to a new moon. Aligning to a new moon gave you a sense of um, schedule. Yes, I do. I do new moon and full moon ceremonies. So it's every two weeks. Actually, that's one of the best things I've done for my mental health. Yeah, definitely. Um, oh, wow. You're, you're like up to date on your research because these are all <laughs> newer things. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, Catherine. So uh, she used an astrological term. I was in the midst of my Saturn return, which is like between the ages of 27 and 29 which is when Saturn returns to the same place in your birth chart that it was on your birth, and it just messes everything up. It's like, you know... I've been in my Saturn return my whole life. <laughs> yeah, I know. I said that to Catherine recently. I was like, I thought this was meant to have ended, but it's still going. <laughs> but it's like where all the structures collapse and the things, it makes you get more authentic. Anyway, I, I just found her online, wrote her a big, long, sad email. When did this part of your journey start? Um... Maybe around 2017. Okay. Yeah. Um, and yeah. After you became vegan, everything opened up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and yeah, she's just, she's amazing. She, we do visualizations like we, we, she, she's all about using, um, well, archetypes, but also animals, you know, mm -hmm. animal totems and, uh, she, we'll, you know, it's, we talk about it, but then she will put me into, We'll go into sort of a, a meditative state yes. and she'll start asking different parts of me to come forward and she'll ask, yes. um, describe them, what color are they, what do they look like, blah, blah, blah. It's, and I write, she writes all this down or, or then we'll ask certain animals to come forward, ask them. And it's crazy the things that come through that I wouldn't have been able to access if it was just like what do you feel is the right choice? Like, sure. It, it, whatever it is, she'll, we'll, maybe we'll have a session with, say, if it's jealousy I'm working with or uh, heartbreak or whatever, she'll get jealousy to come forward and express itself. And it's, it's all about, uh, it's shadow work as well. You know, it's about uh -huh. honoring all these parts of yourself and figuring out what you need, not what's going to be right and sensible. 
it's like what you actually need to make peace with these things. And she was really helpful in, in writing my whole book because um, most of the book is from my younger self, like from my 11 year old self. So I was in constant dialogue through her uh, with mm. my 11 year old self, who I didn't realize was so pissed off, was so angry from the way my situation and the mental health system had been handled mm. and uh, was kind of calling the shots a lot and, and coming forward. And it was crazy. At the end of writing the book, first time in my life, it, it was just like, she feels taken care of my younger self. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And let her go. That's incredible. Um, so do you, is this something you do weekly, these sessions? Not weekly. I talk to her all the time, as in I send her voice notes and ask her advice on things. But it's only every, I'll sort of feel it. It's like, oh, I need to do a session on this. We need to go deeper with this thing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've, uh, Jonathan and I both have experience with, you know, various people in these arenas. Um, I worked with a woman of blessed memory. Her name was Vera. And she did, um, she did some craniosacral and she did some Egyptian healing and she did some Tibetan stuff and then there were things that I, I don't have really a name for, but we would do, you know, kind of she would put me into a meditative place. And um, I saw a lot of images like color. I mean, like very, very interesting. And I learned a lot in those sessions and also felt tremendously rested um, emotionally after um, after sessions, even if they were upsetting. But there was something very grounding about that experience. Wow. Your first Vera story of how she said, like, she couldn't go near you for the first I time. I paid her to not come near me for like five <laughs> sessions. She said my body would not let her. And I was like, you're just trying to make money off me, lady. Um, and she said, I, I promise, like this is as close as your energy wants me to be. Whoa. And so we would talk and do other things. And then sometimes we would just have silence. Because she was a hands-on worker. She was a hands-on worker uh, and a hoverer, meaning her hands would hover, meaning she would put her hands, you know, even near, she couldn't get. And then um, after several sessions, she um, started to be able to approach my feet. <laughs> and um, we started kind of from there. And I worked with her for many years. Um, she was not just doing that to make money. Two things. One is that when you told me that story, that makes a lot of sense because you take a while to get comfortable with people. Why do you need an audience for this? We can just talk about this when we're not rolling. I was just affirming that that experience of sort of taking Correct. time to get closer to you it, it would, makes a lot of sense given who you are. I kind of joke that that, you know, there's a lot of different shaman and shamanic work out there, um, but that, like, you know, having a shaman in your Rolodex is kind of <laughs> like the thing to do nowadays. Uh, I had my first experience with with a man who was studying shamanic uh, work probably when I was about 18, and over the course of a handful of years, we did uh, a few soul retrievals for me, and Ooh. there was like a... Where a, were we retrieving your soul from? <laughs> well, in... Can I put it back? <laughs> Uh, well, the theory is like there's the classic book Way of the Shaman that teaches yes. people how to journey to the different planes of existence. And um, like you do, you know, like you do. Um, that's what I was doing in my first go at university while other kids were out partying and drinking. I was reading that and trying to figure out uh, how to journey to the underworld using <laughs> drumming uh, hypnosis. And the theory is that when we experience traumatic events, different parts of our essence or our soul or whatever it is, they sort of break off and they get attached or they separate. And that this is a bringing back together all the aspects of, of who we are. Mm -hmm. And so a ceremony can have some preparation where for a handful of uh, nights and or weeks, you're sort of preparing um, intellectually, spiritually to bring these aspects back and saying that I'm open to this process. And then you go and or I how it happened for me is I went and had this ceremony with this person who then journeys on your behalf. And you can be given um, spirit animals and they can be and you can be given guides and messages that come back. And then there's an integration process usually for a handful of weeks or even months and or, or years. Maybe you're still in the integration process. Well, I, I found it was fascinating. I have these notes somewhere and many of the things that uh, were brought back to me sort of integrated and hmm. transformed in my life. I'm writing was a huge component of it. And uh, in my first soul retrieval, there were aspects and, and visual imagery of writing and uh, being a writer. And then hmm. sort of those got reintegrated and I went off and went to writing school that I hadn't planned wow. on doing. And uh, yeah, I found it 
quite fascinating. Uh, and many of the things that sort of were brought back ended up playing thematic roles in my life moving forward. And so for you, um, this this kind of journey has been something, let's say, in the last handful of years. Um, so as- astrology, and I love the story of Catherine. Was that her name? Mm-hmm. Um, and then is the are the moon ceremonies that you do, are those private? Do you do them in a group? I do them with um, my cousin who lives just around the corner from me. We get huh. a fire pit. Um, there's a astrologer that we love to follow called uh, Yasmin Boland, and she does these ceremonies, and she, she gives you uh, – she gives – sort of these worksheets based on your star sign or your rising sign and you know in a nutshell the new moon is about setting intentions and new goals um, and putting that out there and then the full moon is about letting go surrendering forgiveness making space for new things to come in so it's just a really nice process like doing it every two weeks even if you don't really believe in the power of the moon which is immense um even if you don't believe in you it you can't not believe in it like it's a whole gravitational thing it's but right yes. <laughs> but some people you know they might not believe that you can be affected by it but even if you don't it's it's actually a really good way just to organize your life and to check in and to uh you know consciously set goals um and you know two weeks is a nice space of time to be sort of working on one thing or, uh, yeah. yeah. I just think intention setting is, is important in your day-to-day life, but just in your overall life. Like, cause otherwise you can end up saying yes to everything and not doing what you really want to do. Um, yeah, I love it for that. I love it for sort of figuring out what's most important. The new moon is a, it's a Jewish ceremony for thousands of years. We commemorate it. Um, wow. Yeah, every month when it's the new moon, there's a special blessing that we say in synagogue. And um, you're typically given off school. Girls' schools are given off school because the moon is associated with the female power in Jewish tradition. Um, It rules the night, whereas the sun rules the day. And women are known as the protectors of things that are private and guarded um, in special ways. Anyway, so it's a it's a woman's holiday. And I actually started a it's called Rosh Chodesh, uh, the head of the month. And I started a Rosh Chodesh group in college um, where women would gather on the new moon every month. And there's a different theme for every Jewish month that we would study. It kind of gained traction with the women's movement was brought back from a ancient practice. But even now, if you go to synagogue and it happens to be a new moon, the entire congregation uh, blesses the new moon. So it's kind of a cool thing. And our holidays are lunar. So Mm -hmm. every two weeks, if there's like Passover was on a full moon. So the two weeks before I knew when the new moon came, I had (laughs) two weeks to get ready. That's so cool. That's a great practice to have. Thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you for your book, which is really, really stunning. Um, and we will um, post about it and let people know about it. It's really, um, again, as as a piece of writing, it's really beautiful. But the content of it and what you chose to share is really, really special. And it was really, really just lovely to talk to you. Oh, thank you. It's so kind. Really, it's an honor to be on. I love your work. I love everything you do with the podcast, but also for animal rights. Thank you so much. Take care. And I really look forward to just seeing what you do next. I want to read things that you write. I want to I want to study shamanic things. I want to have a moon ceremony with you. I'll come to London. Definitely. Thank you, Maya. And thank you, Johnson. Nice to meet you both. I want to clarify that when I was talking about plant medicine, I was not necessarily talking about psychedelics. And no, that's not. Oh, is that a thing? You weren't talking about weed? No. I Well, she went right to ayahuasca, and I didn't oh, know no, that Oh, no, I didn't. I was talking about, like, flower essences. That's what I thought. <laughs> Is that not what we're talking about? I don't think that's what we were talking, talking about. She's talking about drugs? She was talking about Transcendental hallucinog- experiences? Yes. And it sounds like... Well, now I feel stupid. I know. I was, like, suggesting, like, flower essences and, like, plant extracts. Are we the nerdy kids at the party? I think so. We, we're not hip. I think more often than not, I'm realizing if someone uses plant medicine... I had no idea. They probably mean psychedelics first unless otherwise clarified. Because, like, 10 years ago, or even 20, year, 20 years ago now, when I started being introduced to plant medicine, like, yeah, people were shrooming, but, like, the na- <laughs> the the natural path that I was going People to were was pass was passing me passion flower okay. and lavender. I- <laughs> so first of all, people shrooming <laughs> is a, a a recreational experience that many people have, which can be transcendental, powerful. But plant medicine, to me, at least now that I'm researching a little, is a little more of a, a practice tradition um, in line with 
what many indigenous people have done for thousands of years. And there's shamanic practices there, there's a, there's, associated. There's often leadership around it, meaning a guide process. Um, there's often a, a, a cleansing dietarily before. It's not just like, let's go shrooming and like, okay. No, of course. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But yeah, like 15 year olds like shrooming in the forest, I don't think is it's what not plant medicine. <laughs> All right, you want to hear my quick rundown of our note of my notes for this episode? Yes. One, Mime talk about all the ways you've been ruled by shame. <laughs> <laughs> That's its own episode. I didn't bring this up, but we've talked about it before. The acronym for shame should have already mastered everything. And I was thinking what she was saying. That was actually very interesting that her, you know, her father's perspective is like shame is good. It's like kind of like a lot of people feel that guilt is good, right? Teaches you right from wrong, keeps you locked up in your house, you'll never have sex, you won't drink, you won't say anything bad. Nothing can go wrong and you'll go straight to heaven. I also thought it was interesting the numbing of the other aspects of herself mm -hmm. by focusing on one thing. People yeah. don't really understand that so many addictions, um, substance or behavioral have like that's what they're trying to do. Oh, and so we try to fix the behavior or the substance use. But really what we're uncovering and as you like to say if you want to figure out why you're doing the thing you're doing stop doing it many people associate like overeating or compulsive overeating with like oh you're numbing like shove your feelings down stuff your feelings with food it's the same disease meaning if your obsession or your fixation or your your rumination is around what you look like your worth being dependent on your work your body image and all those things You'll just find whatever works for your particular personality. You know, I mean, works meaning you'll find whatever is the tool for numbing. But I would argue this is like one of my one of my um's global theories. Start a list, is that all we do all the time is numb and distract, <laughs> meaning like every single interaction. Like if you make a joke, it's like you know what is it? What does Dan Burns say? If you give someone a present, is it just to make them happy or just to keep them at bay? Right? Like everything we do, it's just like. Deflect, 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 distract, make you feel worse because I feel bad. Like, we're just all numbing all the things all the time. I also had a note about most mental health issues or concerns or experiences are an existential struggle. Well, and I guess this is a, a great time just to clarify what existential means. Um, you know, existential relating to existence, but then it's kind of like, well, what does that mean? Um some of your most famous existentialist philosophers, um, Kierkegaard, um, Dostoevsky, Sartre, Nietzsche, Camus. Yeah, so, um, you know, the, the notion of our value, meaning why, literally why we're here, <clears throat> existential angst or crisis is not the same as depression. It's simply, um, you know, a fixation with um, dread, anxiety, um, confusion surrounding our place. And um, much of my favorite sort of learning about existentialism has come from the, um, the, the fiction writings of these gentlemen, um, because you see existentialism play out where we try and figure out where are we a subject and where are we an object, you know? Um, Marcuse, I think, also, you know, in this kind of era of, of literature and philosophy in particular, but the notion of, like, where do I end and your needs begin, meaning as a culture, as a society. So I think that that was a very, very interesting observation um, and kind of line of thinking when you think about eating disorders, because it is, it's completely subjective, but a lot of what we do is based on what we think other people need from us or what we expect you know, of ourselves for the purpose of other people. I hope that wasn't confusing, but existentialism is confusing. I was moving away from eating disorders and thinking just about when we don't understand our place in the universe, and I know that's a pretty tall order, or we don't understand why we're here or how to feel okay taking up space and we don't feel a strong sense of connection, that's an upstream issue that then creates a lot of downstream problems. Um, yeah, say more. Like, say what that looks like. So... You said existential crisis is not the same as depression. It is not. But if I feel a strong sense of connection to my place in the universe and a strong comfort taking up space and connection to other people around me, mm -hmm. it's much harder to feel depressed. It's not impossible. I find a way. <laughs> 
Yes, you're right. Sorry. And if I feel that I'm waking up each day with a sense of like value and that sure. and I have purpose, it's much harder to feel a sense of anxiety because I have a through line through to my life that I'm like, oh, I'm I've woken up with a sense of of meaning. Well, and and one of sort of my my larger takeaways from you know from this conversation with her was was that there are there are so many ways to kind of get to what your issues are, you know, and you and she talked about it in, when she mentioned her her therapist, Natasha, who's throughout her book, um, you know, getting into less talk therapy or classic talk therapy. Um, and just that notion that there are many, many ways and we all get to choose different ways. And the whole, you know, kind of experience of humanity is we were scattered across the globe and we speak different languages and we have different climates and cultures. And so every culture will do their best. Mm -hmm. You know, every religious tradition, this is essentially what we're trying to explain, right? Every cultural tradition, this is what we're trying to, to figure out. Uh, you know, where do we have purpose? We were talking about this with the spring holidays that you and I just, you know, were celebrating and, and Passover and like, what's the purpose of a bunch of people sitting together to talk about something that happened thousands of years ago and maybe it didn't happen and why are we all talking about it and mm -hmm. everybody's so sad. And the notion is that, you know, I can only speak for my particular culture and religious, like religious tradition, that's the way we've chosen to tell stories for lots of reasons. And every culture has those, you know, and that's what religious structure is trying to give us or trying to give us a sense of value purpose and the notion that you'll be saved and redeemed in the next world <laughs> helps us be hopeful but i think the whole point of the enlightenment and you know this kind of thinking and and modern thought is well what if i'm not just saying no matter what happens god's going to save me in the next world right then what am i here for how do i interact how do I wake up and not feel like, oh, my God, we're spinning around on a globe. Does nobody think it's crazy? <laughs> Here's what we're not going to do. We're oh, not, yes. We're not going to give you a chance to list all the things that you've been told are wrong with you. And instead, we're going to ask people to tell us uh, what their purpose is and how they feel connected. Do it on the Instagram, at Bialik Breakdown on Instagram. Send us a message. Tag us in a post. Why yeah, not? Tell us if you feel like you've figured it out. What your purpose is. And even it could be small. Mine I, is apparently to make this podcast. I liked how she said that her cat gave her some really good structure. And uh, I mean, if I had that cat, I'd never leave the house. It was very cute. And it I'm so soft. not really like one to fawn over cats. That was adorable. I mean, it was that haircut was outrageous. If you haven't already subscribed, do so everywhere you get podcasts. S give us a review. Five stars. Why not? This is the last time you'll hear us use these voices. Next time we'll have totally different voices. I'll be talking from down here. And I'll be talking from up here. From our breakdown to the one we hope you never have. We'll see you next time. It's Maya Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD or two. One fiction one. And now she's going to break down. It's a breakdown. She's going to break it down.